Law Without Government Part 1 Principles What is government? Government is defined as a territorial monopolist in the field of producing law. It is the sole provider of law, the ultimate decision maker, arbitrator and wielder of force within a territory. As a monopoly, it maintains its position by using aggression, the use or threat of violence, to prevent competing providers of law from emerging. Government is the only organisation that uses the political means, that is, the widely accepted use of aggression to attain wealth. For example, the monopolist declares its own act of theft to be legal, calling it taxation and enforcing compliance. Everyone else must attain wealth using the economic means, producing something of value to others and then engaging in voluntary acts of trade. Government is a territorial monopolist of law, but what is law? Interpersonal conflicts are possible due to material scarcity of resources and goods and diversity of interests between individuals. The potential for conflicts makes property rules and ownership rights necessary for social cooperation. For example, apples are scarce, and this means that if two people both want to eat a particular apple, they cannot both be satisfied. For conflict avoidance, we need property rules to establish who has the ownership right over the apple, that is, who has the right to decide how the apple is used. Laws are property rules that emerge from the resolution of conflicts. The production of law, the resolving of conflicts, is a service provided by an arbitrator or judge. Imagine two individuals stranded on a desert island, Adam and Ben. Adam picks a supply of apples, but then Ben comes along and takes an apple without Adam's consent. That's my apple, because I picked it. It's my apple, because it was on my tree. With no one else on the island, Adam and Ben have no one they can turn to for help resolving this conflict. They may succeed in negotiating a peaceful settlement, or they may resort to physical violence. Now suppose there is a third individual on the island, Charlie. Now there is another possible way for Adam and Ben to resolve the apple conflict peacefully. Ask Charlie for his opinion and agree to whatever resolution he suggests. We're having a dispute over an apple. Both of us claim it as our own. Will you arbitrate for us? This is third party dispute resolution. Adam and Ben both make their cases to Charlie. Charlie must decide who he believes has the stronger claim to the disputed apple, and then pronounce a judgment on the case. I do not think Ben owned the tree, so I award ownership of the apple to Adam. Charlie has just produced a law. He has made a judgment about who the rightful owner of a disputed property is. He is awarded legal ownership of a property to one of the disputants. But Adam feels that it would be unjust if Ben only has to return the apple he stole. Adam wants Ben to be punished and wants compensation for having his time wasted. He insists that Ben pay him five additional apples and then he will consider the matter settled. Unable to resolve this dispute between themselves, they ask Charlie for his opinion. Charlie recognises the need to compensate Adam for his lost time and to punish Ben. His opinion is that a payment of two additional apples from Ben to Adam would be a just resolution to this conflict. Since the purpose of Adam and Ben turning to Charlie was to help them resolve the dispute peacefully, both men will agree to his decision. If one of them does not, then they are back to having to resolve the conflict between themselves, either peacefully or otherwise. By arbitrating on a conflict and helping to resolve it peacefully, Charlie has produced a law. Now suppose some time later on the island another conflict occurs, this time between Adam and Charlie. If they cannot resolve the dispute between themselves, they could ask Ben to arbitrate for them. 
I'll arbitrate for you. When Ben provides them with his opinion on the conflict and suggests a resolution, he too will have produced a law. And if Ben and Charlie ever get into a dispute, they could ask Adam to produce a law for them. There are multiple producers of law in this society. No single producer of law is in a privileged position. There is no ruler and no one is ruled. Everyone is of equal status with respect to the laws. What would a monopoly of the production of law look like on our island? I'll arbitrate for you. No, you are not allowed to arbitrate. I am the only one who can produce law on this island. My law is the law. The injustice of this arrangement would be immediately apparent to both Adam and Ben. But that would mean that you even get to be judge in disputes you are involved in. And you could do whatever you want, like steal from us and order us around, and call it legal. That's right, I am the state. Charlie could only establish himself as ruler and maintain that position if he could somehow convince Adam and Ben that a ruler is necessary, and that with no ruler, anarchy, there would be chaos and disorder. If Charlie is able to maintain a monopoly of arbitration and ultimate decision making, he would have put himself above the law, and Adam and Ben can no longer be considered free men. Now suppose there are a few more individuals in this island society, and two of them have a dispute that they cannot resolve peacefully among themselves. The disputants have a choice of arbitrators that might help them resolve the conflict. There is competition in the production of law. Who will they choose? The ideal arbitrator will be someone who is impartial and who has a good reputation for being fair, honest and wise. With a larger population, some individuals who possess these qualities may find that they can make a living purely by providing arbitration services to disputants. They will be professional judges and may create firms selling laws. Their consumers will be disputants who need help resolving a conflict and their income will depend on their reputation for making wise and fair decisions. If any one of them tries to become a monopolist, for example by insisting on being judge in a case involving himself or a member of his family, he will quickly lose his reputation and his livelihood. The principles of having competition in the field of law do not change as society becomes larger and more complex. In my next video, Law Without Government Part 2, I apply the principles outlined here to a large and complex society, explaining how law could be provided by competing firms. Where food production is monopolised by the government, it can be hard for the people to imagine how it could ever be any other way. They fear they may starve without government to plan and direct food production. They cannot imagine how a free market in food production could possibly work, let alone how much better off they would be with that system. They are too accustomed to having food provided for them by the government. We are accustomed to a society where the arbitration and law industry, the court system, is monopolised by the government. We fear chaos and disorder without government to plan and direct law. We find it hard to imagine how a free market in law could possibly work. In this video I will outline how law and security could be provided by competing voluntary institutions. This is Alice. Alice lives in a free society, where security and law are provided not by a government, but by competing firms. Like most people, Alice demands to feel secure in her person and property. She does not want anyone to aggress against her. Alice also demands that if someone does commit aggression against her, she will have the means to bring the aggressor to justice and receive compensation for her losses. 
a number of competing firms exist to try and satisfy these consumer demands. The firm Alice subscribes to, Dawn Defence, has a good reputation for preventing crime and for obtaining justice when crimes do take place. Alice pays her security bill monthly, the same way she pays for her electricity and telephone services. She is on a standard package, which suits her budget and her lifestyle choices. She has chosen an insurance option, so that if someone steals from her, she is guaranteed quick compensation. One evening while walking home, Alice becomes a victim of aggression, and she is mugged at gunpoint. At the earliest opportunity, Alice calls the emergency service number and is put through to Dawn Defence Emergency Response Centre. They quickly dispatch agents to her location. Unfortunately, by the time their agents arrive on the scene, the mugger is long gone. The agents examine the crime scene and gather witness statements and any evidence that might help them identify and locate the mugger. As specified in their contract, Dawn Defence pays Alice compensation for her losses, enough to cover the possessions taken from her, and a good deal more for her time, trouble and distress. Alice's part in this story is now over. Dawn Defence, however, will want to bring the mugger to justice. They will want to recover their costs, and they have promised their customers that muggers will not get off lightly. After doing some detective work, Dawn Defence identifies with reasonable confidence Bill as the aggressor. They locate him and issue him with a written demand that he pays them $10,000 as a punishment for the crime he committed against Alice. Bill has two choices. He could admit his guilt and pay up so that Dawn Defence leaves him alone, or he could refuse to pay. Bill refuses to pay, claiming he is innocent. Dawn Defence will not want to have a reputation for harassing or using force against innocent people, so it will listen to his case. After hearing his case, if they remain convinced of his guilt, they will insist on payment threatening to use force against him if necessary. Bill now faces the same two choices. If he still refuses to pay, Dawn Defence will send armed men round to his house to enforce their punishment. What if Bill has his own security? After receiving the first letter from Dawn Defence, Bill calls Tanner Justice, the security agency he subscribes to. He tells them he is completely innocent, and that he is being unjustly threatened with force by Dawn Defence. Tanner Justice calls Dawn Defence immediately to discuss the accusation of mugging. They insist on seeing some evidence. They conduct their own investigation. After their investigation, they might agree with Dawn Defence that Bill is guilty. In this case, they order Bill to accept his punishment and will not protect him from any force that Dawn Defence uses against him. Or they might reach the opposite conclusion, that Bill is innocent. In this case, they'll stand by their client, and consider the threats made by Dawn Defence to be aggressive. The two firms just cannot agree about what events took place. So what happens now? Do they fight it out? Such a war would be costly for both sides, and they would suffer reputational damage. Security firms that resort to war soon find themselves bankrupt, as consumers switch to their cheaper and more peaceful competitors. Dawn Defence and Tanner Justice have every incentive to find some peaceful way to resolve the conflict. Since they cannot reach agreement about what happened, the two firms agree to pay for an independent arbitrator to look at the case, and agree to be bound by that arbitrator's decision. Since both firms are large and well established, they have a prior agreement about which firm to go to in such cases. Their chosen arbitrator, Benson Enterprises, is a firm that specialises in resolving such disagreements between security firms. 
Benson's examined the evidence presented by the two sides and listened to their arguments. After careful consideration, they conclude that Bill is guilty of mugging Alice. As agreed, both sides accept the decision. Tanner Justice stand down from defending Bill. Now with no one to protect him, Bill has no other choice but to accept his punishment. Benson Enterprises is a highly respected firm, and no other security firm will agree to defend him now against the force threatened by Dawn Defence, unless new evidence emerges or the reputation of Benson's is brought into question. If Bill cannot afford the $10,000 punishment, Dawn Defence will accept payment over a longer term. They may insist on taking a portion of his wages until his debt, plus interest, is paid, and they may contract with his employer to ensure they are paid on time. If Bill is unemployed, they may insist on taking a more active role in his life. They may force him to work at a place of their choosing. If Bill is dangerous or cannot be trusted to make the payments, they may restrict his movements to a certain region, or as a last resort, to a certain building, a secure workhouse where criminals are held while they pay off their debts to their victims and serve their punishment. Bill's crime against Alice will be noted by the various competing criminal records bureaus, and his identity will be made public in databases and in the media. Security agencies now consider Bill a higher risk for committing further crimes and may take steps to protect their customers from him. Bill may find it difficult to find a security firm that will accept him as a customer, and if he does, he may have to pay higher premiums for it. Because of his record, other business owners may refuse to employ or trade with him, and landowners may not permit him to enter their land. The performance of the security agencies is noted by various competing watchdog organisations that provide consumers with information about the quality of security in arbitration firms. The details of the case are made available to auditors who check that the practices of the security and law firms adhere to quality standards. We cannot know in advance how the security and arbitration firms will be structured. We cannot know how many firms will operate in a given area or how large an area a typical firm will cover. In this video, the two security firms performed a number of distinct functions themselves. Free market competition is needed in order to know whether all these functions will be provided in-house or whether some would be outsourced or provided by distinct firms. All these related industries keep the firms satisfying consumer demands for security and law true to their function of protecting individuals against aggression, serving justice, and maintaining order in society. In my next video, I will consider disagreements between security firms about what punishments are to be used, and disagreements about what constitutes a crime. I'll go on to consider what laws and punishments we can expect to be produced by arbitration firms operating in a free market in law. Where there is free market competition, there is consumer sovereignty. What gets produced is what consumers demand, because any firm producing a good or service that does not satisfy consumer preferences will soon go bankrupt and the resources they control will pass into more capable hands. This video will explain the mechanism by which consumer preferences for law and justice are reflected in the policies and decisions made by arbitrators and protection agencies. There are two potential sources of conflict between protection agencies. We previously looked at a conflict about circumstances. When a client of Dawn Defence accused a client of Tanner Justice of mugging, the two agencies could not agree about what events had actually taken place between their clients. They hired a mutually agreed-upon arbitration firm 
to peacefully settle this disagreement about facts. There was no disagreement about principles. Dawn Defence insisted on punishing Bill with a fine of $10,000, and Tanner Justice had no objection about the suitability of this punishment. But what if they did object? Suppose Tanner Justice felt that Bill should only be fined $5,000. How are the two firms going to resolve this conflict? Both firms will want to avoid war, because war is expensive and their customers are free to desert them and subscribe to their cheaper and more peaceful competitors. Instead of violence, they will negotiate with each other to reach a peaceful settlement. Whether they settle on $5,000 or $10,000, or compromise at something in between, will depend on their respective bargaining power. And this bargaining power depends ultimately on the consumers. To illustrate how consumers influence bargaining power, take a more extreme example a disagreement about the suitable punishment for murder. Bill, a customer of Tanner Justice, murdered Alice, a customer of Dawn Defence, and, possibly after hiring a third party, neither side disputes the facts. The disagreement is that Dawn Defence is in favour of the death penalty for murderers, while Tanner Justice is opposed. Would it be life or death for Bill? It seems as though one protection agency is going to lose out here. Dawn Defence has advertised itself as pro-capital punishment. It has promised its customers that it will seek the death penalty against anyone guilty of murder. They could potentially lose lots of customers if Bill, the murderer of Alice, their customer, escapes with his life. Tanner Justice is anti-capital punishment. It has promised its customers that it will seek to protect them even when they are judged guilty of murder, against anyone who threatens them with the death penalty. If they can't prevent Bill being killed by Dawn Defence, they could potentially lose lots of customers as well. It is in the strong interest of both agencies that their own punishment is the one used. But one of them must back down, because there is no compromise between life and death, and the only other alternative is war. Here is one way they might resolve the conflict peacefully. Suppose Dawn Defence estimates that if it backs down in this case, it will lose $1 million worth of revenue from customers who abandon them because they cannot deliver on their pro-death penalty position. This means they will be willing to pay up to $1 million to ensure that Bill gets the death penalty so that they hold on to these customers. Tanner Justice similarly estimates how many customers they would lose by backing down. They estimate it will lose them $500,000 in revenue, so they will be willing to pay up to $500,000 to prevent Bill getting killed. So the two sides come to an agreement. Dawn Defence offers to pay $800,000 to Tanner Justice if they will stand down in this case and allow them to kill Bill. This deal is worth $200,000 to Dawn Defence. Tanner Justice accepts the offer because, if their estimates are correct, they gain $300,000 from the deal. As with any voluntary trade, both parties benefit from this agreement. As a result, Tanner Justice stand down from defending Bill, and he is executed. Consumers benefit too because, as a whole, they are willing to pay $1 million to see Bill killed, but only willing to pay $500,000 to see him escape with life. We have looked at a conflict about principles, where there is a fundamental disagreement about what punishment is suitable. The conflict was resolved when a payment was made from one firm to another so that their punishment would be the one used in the case. The direction of the payment was determined by the bargaining power of the two firms, 
and ultimately by consumer preferences. If the two firms are large and well-established, they will likely have an advance agreement on what to do when there is a murder between their clients. It may be that Dawn Defence makes annual payments to Tanner Justice, so that capital punishment is used in every case. If we posit additional security firms, some pro-capital punishment and some anti, a network of payments will emerge, with each firm calculating how much a favourable agreement with another firm is worth to them. On other issues, such as what is the suitable punishment for mugging, the pattern of payments may look very different. The pattern is ultimately determined by consumer preferences. One of the many areas in which the protection agencies compete with each other is in how successful they are at getting their advertised punishments enforced against clients of other firms. As we would expect, where there is a free market in law, there is consumer sovereignty. The laws and punishments enforced, in cases where there is a disagreement about what the punishment should be, are determined ultimately by the preferences of consumers, through this bargaining mechanism between protection agencies. Using this framework, we can begin to make reasonable guesses about what laws are likely to exist under a system of competing providers.